Welcome to MedEvidence, where we help you navigate the truth behind medical research with unbiased, evidence-proven facts. Hosted by cardiologist and top medical researcher, Dr. Michael Corrin. Hello, my name is Dr. Michael Corrin, and I'll be leading a unique program of our MedEvidence podcast today, in that instead of speaking with another medical professional, I'll be speaking with one of our patients. And this was an interesting opportunity for me because one of our patients, who has a little bit of background in media, was keen on talking about was what his experience was like when he signed up for a clinical trial, and he's actively participating in a clinical trial. And I'm going to depart from our usual protocol by not using your name, because when I talk to another medical professional, it makes sense to use their name. But because you're a patient, I'm going to give you the respect of privacy and let you introduce yourself to show that it was uncoerced and <laughs> that you're willing to talk to the community about what it was like to be in our clinical study. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, my name is a Andrew Muncy. Uh, I go by Andy usually, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to put that out there and uh, advocate for uh, studies like this, uh, it's something that uh, I was actively looking for a solution for my particular issues, and uh, it's, it's nice to be here to talk about it. Sure. So one of the things that we do in medicine is we like to know a little bit about the background of our patients. And if you're willing to just share a little bit about your background, where you grew up and your profession, and how you ended up here in, in North Florida. I uh, grew up uh, outside Washington, D.C. Um, my parents were in uh, politics and very much an industry town and mm -hmm. uh i did not follow them into politics uh and i uh, got bitten by the writing bug and went out to hollywood to become a television writer uh wrote for a couple of uh different shows uh, a comedy called late line without franken mm -hmm. uh, that actually has had a lot of politics in it and uh an hbo show called arliss mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, fell into a marketing career out there doing mm -hmm. trailers for movies and then uh ending up at nbc mm -hmm. uh working as a promo producer doing the marketing for friends frazier seinfeld will and grace shows nice. like that mm -hmm. um had to move on to move up to <laughs> and went over to abc and uh, worked for them for a while i uh, went back to nbc for <laughs> <laughs> a stint and did The Office and a uh, number of uh, 30 Rock number of shows like that. Mm -hmm. Ended up back at ABC mm -hmm. um, and where I finished up my career uh, just a couple of years ago when uh, I retired. Um, and uh, my medical history is that uh, my background, uh, my father had, had uh, quadruple bypass mm. late in his 60s. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, sometime late in my forties, I, uh, my cholesterol was testing high mm -hmm. and, uh, started, uh, Lipitor and statin drugs that brought it down some, um, diet and exercise had some effect, but, uh, wasn't doing enough. All right. So let's drill into that a little bit. And, okay. and I'll mention the fact that you're involved in a study here treating the cholesterol molecule called lipoprotein little a. And it's actually a cholesterol-containing particle, mm -hmm. but we use the term lipoprotein to describe these things. Mm -hmm. And lipoproteins are these molecules that circulate in our bloodstream that are combinations of fat and protein. And that has to be the case because cholesterol is a fat and it's not soluble in our blood, which is mostly fluid, mostly water. So we have these lipoproteins, and we know that certain lipoproteins are more dangerous than others. There are favorable packages of lipoproteins, for example, HDL or high-density lipoprotein. And then we have the less favorable packages, LDL or low-density lipoprotein, but particularly lipoprotein little a. And you mentioned a very common scenario for people with lipoprotein little a, which is a family history. And lipoprotein little a is a particle that is inherited at high concentrations in an autosomal dominant fashion meaning that if one of your parents has this problem, there's a 50-50 chance they'll pass it along to the to the kids. So it sounds like you you had this gene. And, and tell us a little bit, what was your lipoprotein little a level? Did you know about it before you got involved in the trials? I did. I didn't know about it when I first started um, uh, on, on a statin drug. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up having um, uh, some chest pain playing tennis. 
and that's when I first started, or that's when they increased mm -hmm. uh, the, they doubled the dose of the Lipitor. Mm -hmm. And then a few years after that, I had more chest pains and I had my first uh, angiogram. Mm -hmm. uh, they found blockages, three stents were put in. Um, I tried to be more concerted about the change of diet, exercise, and that sort of thing, had a second uh, angioplasty and a third angioplasty wow. for a total of eight stents. Wow. Okay. In the end. Um, and it was only after the third one that the lipoprotein A was tested and found to be 555. Ooh. Okay. Very o high. Over five times higher very, than very high level, it yes. should be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, sometime after that, in, in April of 2022, mm -hmm. I began, uh, uh on Repatha. Mm-hmm. And, um, On top of the Lipitor. Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, that uh, has actually worked better than the drop by a third that it uh, mm -hmm. is usually done, uh, getting me down to 311. Mm -hmm. uh, still three times wow. higher than it should sure. be, mm -hmm. but happy for some reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had fourth angiogram uh, last, last December. Wow. and keeping the interventional cardiologist busy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately for you. Yeah. Uh, and, and that time they, it was just an angiogram because mm -hmm. they, they were not able to drill out anything mm -hmm. or put in any stents. Uh, the blockages were too far down in the, the branches. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always thought because my father had the quadruple bypass that that was sort of my lot in life and would eventually be what mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, as you would know, uh, I found, came to find out, well, uh, Bypass wouldn't help that issue. And we call that distal vessel disease and cannot be treated with bypass, correct? So, you know, my concern continued to grow mm -hmm. uh, for how how do I get on top of this and, uh, uh, you know, what else can be done? And that's when I began pursuing the issue of lipoprotein A and found out about some studies uh, at the Cleveland Clinic mm -hmm. and the effectiveness of uh, the new drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I reached out to them and I said, I think I might be the perfect candidate for you. You are. <laughs> and they uh, they let me know about uh, mm -hmm. the continuing studies going on, mm -hmm. a list of them in the various states and including Florida. And mm -hmm. so I, I reached out uh, to see if I, I was the right candidate. Yeah, and you screened and you got in the study. Yes. And how long have you been in the study? Uh, since June, late June, I got my first shot. Okay. And uh, have had no side effects. Beautiful. And everything's been great. So I'd explore a few things. Fascinating history, <laughs> a common history. We mm -hmm. see this quite a bit in cardiology, and something that a lot of people in the public sector aren't really aware of. Most people know about cholesterol, of course, and I think the majority of people know about LDL, but very few people know about lipoprotein little a. And one of the reasons they don't know about it is because we really haven't had a treatment specifically for it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Repatha, which lowers it some. We actually did that work here in Jacksonville, and yep. I was very involved in that work. And we showed that we can lower that lipoprotein LA 25 or 30% with something like Repatha, which is called a PCSK9 antibody. Evolocumab is the generic uh, term for Repatha. But that's still not going to help that much, quite frankly, if, if somebody starting out with an LPA level of 500, and it should be 25. Right. So we obviously have a lot of work to do, and we've had to develop other molecules. But before I get into that, I'm curious about a couple of things. What was your total cholesterol or your LDL cholesterol before you were on any drug? Do you remember what it was? Uh, I think about 230. Was your total or your LDL? Uh, total. Total. Do you remember what your LDL was? I don't. Okay. And then after you got to Lipitor, it sounds like they started at a lower dose and titrated up. Mm -hmm. How high was the dose that you got to? Do you, do you recall? I think it went from 10 to 20 okay. of the Lipitor. What was the highest dose that you were ever on for that? I think that's the highest. It's 20. Now I've, uh, and on, I'm on uh, Rosovastatin. Rosovastatin, yeah. Rosovastatin, thank you. How much of that? 20 or 40 milligrams? Uh, 20, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So interestingly, your doctors chose not to put you on the highest doses. Statins don't affect LP little a, lipoprotein little a, so that piece of the puzzle wouldn't be improved by those drugs. Mm -hmm. But you remember how much your LDL dropped or your total cholesterol dropped? I think it went down to 160 in the end. So from 230 total cholesterol to 160. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the reason I'm bringing this up 
is one of the clues to people who haven't had their LPA tested is to see a less than expected drop in LDL when you put on a statin. Mm. So a drug like uh, atorvastatin or Lipitor or Rosuvastatin or Crestor can lower your LDL cholesterol you know, between 40 and 50%. And some people will only see maybe a 25% reduction. And the reason for that is that when you get a standard measurement of your LDL or your bad cholesterol, the LPA portion is in that. Mm -hmm. And that LPA portion is not lowered by the statins. So you get less than expected drop in your LDL when you have a situation like yours. Mm -hmm. So that's an important learning feature for people that may be listening to this. If you have less than an expected drop in your cholesterol or particularly your LDL with a statin drug, there's a chance that this is because of lipoprotein LA. And if you have a family history and that phenomenon of less than expected drop, please get your LPA checked. Some people would argue that LPA should be checked for anybody with coronary disease, which is my standard for my patients. But certainly another clue would be this concept of less than expected drop. Mm -hmm. So let's change subjects just a little bit and talk about what the experience was to get involved in a clinical trial. Must have been scary. Uh, actually, no. I, I, I looked at it as a, an opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that it would be several years before these drugs would reach mm -hmm. market and were, you know, the study I read said it had dropped the LPA down by 95%. Yeah. I thought that, that that's what I want. Sure. And so, and, and from what I read, there weren't side effects to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had no fear going okay. into it. Well, I looked at it as a, as a uh, absolute opportunity. Well, you'd be the exception rather than the rule. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you hadn't done a clinical trial before that. I had not. Okay. No. Yeah. So I, I would think that most people that have not been involved in a clinical trial would be nervous. Mm -hmm. um, you did a lot of research and obviously you're, you looked at this very intelligently, but the truth is that when you're using products that are relatively new, that there may be some concerns. Yeah. There may be even some fear. You know, once you've exhausted uh, all of the options you have of, you know, changing your diet, increasing your exercise, reducing stress by right. retiring from a stressful job right. and, and moving to, to the Florida coast and life is good <laughs> and you still have, you know, another, oh, yeah. another angiogram, right. your, your, your mind opens up. Well, unfortunately, all those lifestyle issues will not touch your LP little A. Right. It's, one of, it's interesting. Um we, we certainly advocate lifestyle changes and diet and exercise can do wonderful things. They have modest effects on, on cholesterol in general. Mm -hmm. But LPA is one of these genetic uh, concerns or diseases, if you want to look at it as a disease. But it's a risk factor that's because of your parents and, and your genes. And it's very, very difficult to change short of some of these new drugs and these really breakthroughs that we're working with now in research. It's extraordinary. That's a, you know, everyone has genes built in that uh, you normally can't do anything about the fact that medicine is advanced in this way to be able to stop the generation yeah. of LPA uh, that your body's naturally doing is a wonderful opportunity, especially since it seems to have no side effects. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that. I would never say something has no side effects, just oh, to be well, clear. But My experience. <laughs> but a, a couple of things is one is that I like to, one of my quips that I like to share with patients is that one of the most important things about your own personal health is to choose good parents. Ah. <laughs> and uh, well, I have that. Right. Uh, maybe well, a, a in, few in many select, cases, I'm sure they're great parents. Genes, maybe not. Right. So, but it, with every with every uh, choice, there may be a, a thing or two that you can make issue with. But right. um, nonetheless, in in your case, you have this gene, and standard therapies have very little ability to affect this gene, and so you you look to clinical trials as a as a great option, and yeah. you're the perfect candidate. So, thank you for being part of the study, and hopefully, it'll work out for you. Now, in fairness, we like to be very upfront, there's a chance you're not on an active drug when you're right. in a study. Did that concern you? Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I, I figured uh, once I realized that I didn't have to change anything about my current uh, medications and that, uh, you know, it, it, either I got lucky and was on the drug or, it, you know, it was just doing everything I could otherwise. Right. So why not? Right. So one of the things we talk about in our med, med evidence platform is the truth behind the data. And for things in medicine, things in life, quite frankly, but particularly in medicine, there's things that we know for sure. There's things we definitely don't know. 
And then there's a way, a process to figure out the stuff we don't know. And that's what we do in clinical trials is we figure out the stuff we don't know. So we do know that LP little a or lipoprotein little a is a very potent risk factor for heart disease. And there are many families like your family where this is probably what's driving your cardiovascular complications. You know, you're a thin guy, you're a fit guy. You, I'm sure even uh, in your previous life before you had your stents, you were relatively conscientious about your health is my guess. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, you still had these complications as did your parents. Uh, I didn't get into brothers and sisters, but they would have a 50-50 chance of having the gene as well, right. assuming it's just coming from one parent. And, um, uh, you know, you don't have to go into their whole story, but uh, they would certainly be people I would want to screen right. for this particular problem. So if they haven't been screened, I would encourage them to do so. But the point I'm making here is that we don't know if lowering lipoprotein little a is going to make a difference. And that's why we do the studies. Mm -hmm. So another thing that we do know is, as you mentioned, we have products that can now lower LPA by 90, 95, close to 100% in some cases. It's remarkable. And the, the, the product that, that um, has been the most successful is the product that you're participating in, study of the product you're participating in, called a small interfering RNA. And this is now Nobel Prize winning technology that shows that our body has the natural ability to suppress certain gene expression. So you go back to your old high school or college biology days, you probably remember <laughs> is that the genes are in the nucleus of the cell. And they send an RNA signal out to the cytoplasm of the cell, which pr pr allows our body to produce these proteins. And of course, in a lipoprotein, there's a protein. And we now have learned, again, through scientific exploration, that we can block the transcription of that protein in the cytoplasm of a cell. Hmm. And this is the concept of small interfering RNA, where we send a signal to the liver cells that make this bad protein and prevent that from occurring. And wow. if you don't make the protein, you can't make the particle. All right. And so that hopefully that made sense to you. It does. And and that's how these things work. And we know with this small interfering RNA technology, and there are products on the market, particularly one product that lowers PCSK9 using this mechanism that's now been on the market. We've done a lot of research search with it. Very effective at lowering LDL cholesterol and appears safe. So this is a really exciting new area where we can intervene and have a huge impact. But we don't know yet if that lowering of the lipoprotein little a will result in fewer heart attacks and strokes. Right. And you're helping us figure that out. So right. we appreciate that. And hopefully along the way, you glean some nuggets of information uh, so that whether or not you're on the medication that we're testing, you'll get some benefit from what we're doing. So talk to me a little bit about that. Tell people what it's like to come into a clinical trial center and and be part of this. Is it like a doctor's office or different? Just a little bit of your experience. It's it's been very easy. Uh, uh, you know, uh, because I had uh, so many cardiovascular events and procedures, I'm fairly used to <laughs> having to to go for various appointments and things. And so uh, it it was all very easy to come in take the survey, answer the questions, uh, had to go back and do some family medical history and check mm -hmm. in with, with relatives about mm -hmm. some of the, the specifics. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, there was, there was nothing to it. Mm -hmm. And is, is it enjoyable? Uh, do you feel when you leave, when you leave the office after a visit, do you feel uplifted? Do you feel, uh, depressed, confused? I, no, I'm very excited to be part mm -hmm. of the, the study. And, and obviously I, you know, I'm, very hopeful that it stops this pattern sure. of needing some intervention because mm -hmm. of a blockage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and beyond that, you know, I, I'm aware of the, well, what about the rest of me? What about my carotid arteries mm -hmm. and their blockage? And they've been scanned and they're in, in good shape now. Good. Excellent. But, you know, I, I would hope that uh, being part of this study would keep that yeah. being the case. Oh. Yeah, it's interesting. When we do surveys of patients like you, obviously you're driven. The value proposition for you is to get a treatment that you can't get elsewhere. You, you yes. say that. Other people do it for different reasons. Some people just like the socialization of being part of this. <laughs> um, most people will say that when you go to a physician's office these days, the physicians are 
so stressed for time that they run you in and out as quickly as possible. Whereas in a clinical trial setting, it's much more relaxed, much more comprehensive. It's, it's actually more social. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for some people, they're driven by the fact that they get uh, compensation for what they do in the studies. Um, that's a driving factor for some people, not not for everybody. In a case like yours, it's, it's really uh, access to the product and trying to tr change your disease course. Yeah, I didn't realize that that was part of this, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a nice little bonus. Yeah. And then the other item that I think is relevant in your case, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a legacy issue. I don't know if you have children or not. Mm -hmm. but one, one daughter. Yeah. Has she been tested for LPA? And not yet. Okay. No. But uh, she knows that she needs to on the, their next checkup. Well, let's test her. We'll, we, yeah. we'll, we'll do it for free here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, okay. So, That'd so, be great. Yeah. So it's, it's actually a relatively simple test, but it probably would not be recommended by her primary physician because, again, it's not part of national guidelines yet for somebody that doesn't have coronary disease. Right. But given the family history, why not? And again, uh, siblings of yours should also be tested if they have not already. Yeah. And even after uh, it took the third uh, mm -hmm. angioplasty mm -hmm. for mine to be tested. Yeah. A few years ago so it, it, well hopefully that's going to change where part of this is to educate physicians as right. well as patients about this particular problem and uh, we're in that zone where we don't have all the answers yet so we, we do think that interventions of lipoprotein little a will be important we know that lowering LDL in patients like you is very very important but you're going to be part of this process where uh, doctors and patients around the world are going to help us figure this, this out. So I thank you for your participation. It's really, really important. And the other thing, um, I was very pleased to hear that Cleveland Clinic uh, kind of guided you uh, along the way. We work with Cleveland Clinic on a number of projects. Uh, Steve Nissen is um, head of cardiology at Cleveland Clinic, and he and I have published together on uh, multiple occasions. Terrific guy, uh, just you know, evidence-based guy, so we have great conversations. And um, the fact that we all work together as a fraternity, if you will, of people that run clinical trials is, is a neat part of what we do. Mm -hmm. So we share data with each other. And interestingly, uh, people in Europe and around the world will learn from your experience. And the flip side is I'll learn from the experience of patients that are in Asia and Europe that are part of these trials as well. So again, we thank all of you for your participation. Happy to do it. So any final words that you want to share with the audience that may be considering doing a clinical trial? Uh, just, I agree with everything you've said. It's, it's easy. It's, uh, it's nice to have the opportunity to have a discussion on these issues and, and especially such a specific issue that, uh, my cardiologist and, and, uh, primary physician were aware of and knew that it, you know, needed to be tackled, uh, but weren't in a position to, uh, take advantage of these new advances. Mm. So I, I just think uh, the clinical trial is a wonderful opportunity to do that. And ho hopefully I'm getting the drug. And if not, then uh, hopefully it will come to market at uh, some point and uh, will help me down the yeah. line. And in many cases, the manufacturer will make that drug available if it's proven to be successful. Again, we can't guarantee that, right. but I, I'm loving, lobbying for it as we speak. Excellent. So, one of the things that I do for all my patients is to make sure that the manufacturers know how important that is. Yeah. So you mentioned Repatha, and that was an example where we successfully lobbied Amgen to make Repatha available for the people who participate in clinical trials, whether or not they were assigned to the drug during the, during the course of the study. Okay. So, Andy, thank you for being part of the study. Thank you for okay. being part of MedEvidence, and uh, thank you for being part of the process of making healthcare better. Thank you for your work you're doing. Thanks for joining the MedEvidence Podcast. To learn more, head over to medevidence.com or subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform.